I haven't seen the signals yet that show me that the decline is close to an end. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, excited to have Brian Burke with Praxis Capital. Brian, how are you doing today? Good, Todd. Good to see you again. Yeah, man. You know, I look, I had to look up when did I last have Brian on the show? And it was episode number 96. That means it was 2018 when I had you on the show. So it's been a while. Wow, uh, I can't believe it's been five years. Time flies. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's been five years since I had you on the show, unless I had you a second time, but I only could find that one. That, that, that one. So this is the second time as far as I know. Uh, excited, uh, long overdue, uh, because you've got a ton of experience in the industry. Uh, I enjoy talking with you, and you're kind of one of the one of the guys uh, in the industry that I think a lot of people, if they know you, they go, "Yeah, I mean, what what's what's Praxis doing?" Um, you know, they they seem to have their head on straight, and if Praxis is is you know doing something, you know we should maybe look at it and see what's going on there. Not that we're going to follow it, but we're going to at least keep an eye on it. So, uh, so def definitely a wealth of knowledge with you and, and happy to have you back on the show. Yeah. I'm really happy to be here. I just can't believe it's been five years. It's like uh, amazing how time flies and mm -hmm. you're right. I think this is the second one. Cause I don't remember being on here and a lot's happened in the last five years. So oh, this is going to be exciting. Yeah. Well, why don't you, let's just talk about what's happened with, you what's happened with Praxis over the last five years since I'd say you were on probably mid 2018. Yeah, well, we we bought about I don't know three or four thousand units probably since I was on your show last, and and we had um, uh, about a four thousand unit portfolio as of uh, 2020. You know, during COVID, and it was a little bit scary when. COVID came around and wondering yeah. like, you know, what's, what's really going to happen here? You know, yeah. is this going to be a real problem for us or, uh, or not? It turned out not to be a big problem, but maybe a, you could say a big gift, I guess, in some ways, because the market just went absolutely nuts and seeing what was happening and recognizing um, kind of the, I would say unwarranted euphoria surrounding the market we became aggressive sellers and in 2021 and the first half of 2022 which is where i believe the peak of the of what we might call the peak of the current market occurred uh, we sold three quarters of that 4000 unit portfolio and maybe wow. a little more than that and it was it was fantastic because prices were running up way out of control we were getting way above what we'd ever would have expected reaching 10 year projections and sometimes a year and a half you know that kind of mm. stuff and it was just a real opportune time to, you know, get the hell out <laughs> is what we were seeing. And, uh, you know, since that time, the market's been, I would say, somewhat in what I would call a precipitous free fall. And we've been uh, uh, just kind of uh, waiting on the sidelines to see, you know, what our next move is going to be. I haven't bought anything in two years. And uh, I don't know how long it's going to be before I do buy something. So, um yeah, it's been it's been kind of an exciting five years since uh, since I was last here, Todd. <laughs> you bought and sold a, a bunch of properties, um, and and yeah, I think that you know obviously great time to sell. Um, so the price has run up. You looked at it. That's a difficult decision, right? Because you don't know. One of the things that I think was difficult, in, in my opinion at least, is trying to timing the market can be challenging and i know a, a, a guy who sold a portion of a, actually i think it was all of their portfolio in 2016 i believe it was that said we're at the peak of the market 2016 maybe it was 2017 we're at the peak of the market it can't get any higher it's going to go down so i'm going to sell everything he sold everything I, th I think it was 2017 um and and I said to him, I said, well, what if you're wrong? How long will it take before you start to buy again? I said, what if the market keeps on going up for another five years? He said, well, 
if that happens, I'll have to start buying again. And I said, well, but what if you're wrong and that's the peak of the market and it starts to go down right after that? So that's that's a challenge, right? To predict and you made a great prediction or um, I guess gut feeling, whatever you want to call it, you you, you landed properly. Um, but beyond what you've just talked about, is there any other reasons why you said let's sell? Uh, yeah, there is. Cause I've seen this movie before, you know, I managed, <laughs> I, I timed this once before too, in the great financial collapse of 08, 09, you know, 2007, 8, 9, that period, you know, I pretty much stopped buying all real estate in around 04, 05. And the market started collapsing in 05, 06, bottomed out in uh, 09. And that was when I began aggressively buying again. And, you know, I, I one thing I learned about market timing is that it's not about as much about looking at numbers that people tend to look at to try to gauge market tops and uh and it's more about psychology and so when everybody is a buyer everybody is a syndicator everybody is putting up six figure non-refundable deposits at contract signing when you start to see that happening more and more, that's telling me there's a little bit of an unjustified market euphoria at play. Mm -hmm. And that was the same thing that was happening in 04, 05, and maybe even a little bit in the early part of 06 that led to uh, the collapse of the residential real estate market in the great financial collapse. So that's what we were seeing. You know, we we had one property that we got an unsolicited offer way above what we ever thought we could achieve. Uh, we said, well, if you're going to pay that price, I'd be stupid to say no. So it's yours. And when that happened, we started to see, well, let's test it out and see if other people are making that same decision. And, mm -hmm. you know, just one by one, we just started picking them off. And uh, it was really a lot more about that than saying, oh, well, you know, population growth and this and that and rent growth and all this other stuff. Uh, you know, that might have been what your friend was looking at in, you know, 2016 or 17 or whatever. And, and I'm wondering, so did he start buying in 2021? Yes. 2022. Yes. Oh, oh no. Uh, that's mistiming the market at its best. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. that, that actually takes a lot of really, really bad luck. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I kind of say that I'd rather be a week late than a day early. And so, you know, right now I, I'm not calling a bottom yet. Yeah. I mean, in 2004, you're selling things. You're probably a little bit early, right? You could have ridden 2005, the early part of 2006 and, and been okay. But at the same time, you didn't get stuck. That's good. 2021, again, you're probably a little bit early, but you didn't get stuck. You could have ridden 2021 through and into it mid part of 2023 and sold right at the peak, but that's impossible probably to, to time exactly. Um, so smart decisions. And I think if you, in hindsight, like looking back at it, a lot of the same stuff was there over exuberance. Like you said, everybody's into it. Uh, back in, I wasn't really in real estate in, in that 2000, you know, three, four, but I was paying attention and everybody was doing it and everybody wanted to do it. And everybody and their uncle and their brother and their sister were buying single family homes, flipping them, renting them, 0% down, you know, all kinds of stuff. And so the writing was kind of on the wall. If you're paying attention, like, Hey, look, every single person is doing this. This is the coolest thing to do probably not the best time to be in this or probably the best time to sell this stuff because everybody's willing to overpay. The same thing with 2021, 2022, like you said, everybody was a syndicator and it didn't matter. They took a, they took a course over a weekend and they were going to be buying 100, 200, 300 unit building or whatever it was. With other people's um, money. With other people's money. Yeah. yeah we talked that, to, we it. talked to a group, Brian, um, about potentially partnering on a deal. And it was, we kind of looked through it. We actually got introduced by, uh, by a friend um, to these guys. And as we we're doing due diligence on the deal, 
we were doing due diligence on them as well because they wanted to stay in as a GP position. And the due diligence on them actually was what shut the deal down um, because, you know, as we were looking at it, they had 2,000 units that they claimed they owned. There was many other things, but they had 2,000 units that they claimed they owned, yet they didn't have enough net worth to show even a million dollars worth of net worth. They weren't accredited investors and they had no liquidity whatsoever. And so they couldn't even qualify to for any kind of loan. And we was like, you have 2,000 units. How does that even happen? Well, of course, you know, they, they owned half a percent of 2,000 units type of thing. But it was it's that type of stuff that was continuously happening over, you know, I would say even 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, um, it just kept on going skyrocketing yeah that's that's right and you saw a lot of that kind of stuff happening that's why due diligence on the sponsor is so critical and you know the thing about real estate syndication is that there there's two elements of risk uh versus direct real estate ownership has really one element of risk and that's the real estate right or real estate in the real estate market overall but in a syndication investment the sponsor is this new element of risk that's injected that isn't present in you know direct real estate ownership unless you consider yourself to be a risk which you know you, you probably should everybody's everybody's yeah. always learning right yeah. but you know you've got somebody else that's in charge of your um uh your investment and in the composition of uh that group is extraordinarily important and people don't give that credit enough and people uh, you know on both sides of the transaction the gravity of that added risk is under appreciated uh the investor uh doesn't necessarily fully appreciate the added risk the group is bringing to the transaction and oftentimes uh these newer syndicators don't understand the gravity of the responsibility yeah uh, that they have in safeguarding the capital of their investors. And when both sides are lackadaisical about this risk, it results in, uh, you know, bad outcomes. And and I have a feeling that, you know, we've seen a few bad outcomes over the course of the last, you know, six, 12 months. And I have a feeling we've only seen the tip of that iceberg. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Definitely agree with that. Um, do you re- like, is there any um, regret in selling any of those? So you you had you sold about three thousand units because you said you had about four thousand and you sold about three cores of them. So you sold about three three thousand units. Yeah, um, yeah. Is there is there regret with selling those? Because why why not just hold them? Why not just say, hey, let's you know, yeah, we're gonna get some rocky times here, but let's just hold these things in cash flow them. Why sell? Yeah, no regret whatsoever. You know, kind of back to my comment about week late versus day early, that really applies to buying. In selling, I'd rather be a week early than a day late. Uh, Because the problem is when you, when, when the market shifts from up to down, from, let me back up, when the market shifts from down to up or level to up, It's a slow kind of drawn out process that takes a while for people Mm -hmm. to gain confidence and to start, you know, moving the market. But when the market shifts from, you know, really, uh, uh, really good to bad, it happens at the flip of a light switch. And if you look at July of 22, uh, July of 21, which is where I think the true market peak was. Uh, it's almost a flip of a light switch from prices that a deal would have traded at in, say, April, May of June of 21 versus August, September, October of 21. Almost a 10 to 15, maybe 20 percent instantaneous decline. You know, and then the decline slows down a little bit. And, you know, then there's an ongoing decline until you reach a bottom. That's the way these things tend to work. And and I have zero regrets about selling. In fact, uh Four of the properties, four properties that we sold have been re-offered to us by brokers 
because the owners are trying to get out from under them. Mm. And they, uh, not knowing that we sold to them, were like, oh, hey, we got this great value add deal, you know, with a proven upside <laughs> potential. <laughs> You're like, yeah, we like, proved it. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah, which one is that? And it's like, they tell us and it's like, oh, good Lord. And and I just did the math on one. There's um, there's a two, we sold two properties to one buyer and they're now trying, they were trying to sell uh, these two properties uh, again, and when I calculated, you know what we we uh, we sold them, uh, bought them, and sold them inside two years, and uh, we sold them for close to double what we paid for them. Wow. And now the uh, the current uh, owner is uh, was selling at about what I calculated as a seventeen million dollar loss in two years. And they're just trying to hopefully sell them for the amount of their loan. So would I rather be in that position or would I rather have all that cash, you know, back and, uh, you know, produce a 30% IRR or better for our investors, uh, you know, load their pockets with cash uh, and get out and have no risk, no sleepless nights, no nothing, let the market fall, let somebody else lose $17 million and then, you know, get back in the market later after the prices come back down. You know, a lot of people say, you know, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait as if timing has no basis in the outcome. And, and I just couldn't disagree with that thesis more. I mean, yeah. timing is critically important. The people that bought real estate in 2005, had to wait almost 10 years to get back to even. And if you if you factor in the time value of money, that's an extraordinary loss on that capital that could have produced returns through that 10 year period if timing was better. And it, those who got out in 05 and then rebought in 2010 made an absolute killing. And I can attest to that because we did it. You know, we bought 120 rental houses in the San Francisco Bay Area between 2010 and 2012 mm. and sold them at about two and a half X within five years of what we paid for them. Meanwhile, people that bought in 05 were selling at the same time we were selling and trying to hope to break even. That's the difference the timing will make. Yeah. Yeah. It, and that was obviously a very deep uh financial recession. Uh, so it's not necessarily that case uh, all the time, but if real estate values, I mean, what, what do you see in real estate values have, have gone down by so far? Well, that depends a lot. Yeah, it depends a lot. So uh, single family homes in most markets that, that I follow, not really down at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're, they're holding up remarkably well. Uh, multi, uh, uh, um, Commercial office is absolutely annihilated in most markets. And with the kind of gateway cities taking it the worst, San Francisco, New York, uh, especially, uh, office is just a complete disaster. It's a total dumpster fire. There's going to be so many uh, lenders that are going to lose a lot of money in that arena. Retail is actually holding up fairly well, surprisingly. Uh, mm -hmm. Multifamily, which is kind of our our core business and our specialty, um, kind of depends on market. Uh, the Midwest has held up, I think, probably the best out of anywhere uh, in the country because Midwest rent growth is still doing what mid growth Midwest rent growth has always done, which is yep. slowly grow. You know, slow and, and steady, slow and steady, or kind of nothing to see here, kind of a thing. But uh, you're looking at markets like Phoenix. Uh, you know, where rents were climbing 30 to 40% annual rent growth for, right. for bursts of time. Cap rates uh, were you know, 3%. Oh, rates. Yeah. And cap rates in the threes. And I mean, that stuff is easily off 20 to 30% uh, from its peak pricing. I think the Sunbelt markets in general, if you go across Arizona, Texas to Florida, you know, throughout that whole swath, I think you're seeing uh, declines in the 15 to 25% range. Uh, it's not quite enough yet. I, I, you know, there's, there's multiple things at play, you know, if you're in a, um, a golf uh, exposure or a South Atlantic exposure where you have uh, wind risk, 
Your insurance premiums are absolutely going through the roof. And anywhere, quite frankly, but yeah. Anywhere, but especially yeah. there, you know. So, you know, we've been seeing, uh, you know, 20 to 50% increases in, in insurance premiums pretty much everywhere. But in the, in, we have one property with golf exposure, we're up about 600% on our insurance. Uh, from oh, where we were cow. two years ago. So it's, you know, that kind of stuff is just absolutely killing, you know, those uh, hurricane exposure markets just because the, uh, you know, you capitalize the extra insurance yeah. expense at a five or 6% cap rate. And, and that's a, that's a tremendous drop in building value. So yeah. uh, it's, it's been, it's, it's been pretty rough out there. And, um, I, but at the same time, prices aren't low enough to make deals work. So I, I think, uh we haven't seen the bottom yet. You know, I get, I got an email from a broker the other day and it was, you know, prices are down 20%. Now's the time to buy. What are you waiting for? It was that type of email. Like, yeah, you, you're an idiot type of email if you're not buying. Right. And it didn't say that specifically, but, but that was how it was, you know, it's like, hey, you got to buy now. Like prices are down. Obviously they're trying to sell real estate. Right. But it's prices are down 20, maybe 30%, 15, whatever it is in, in the specific market. Why wouldn't you buy if they're down that far? Like, it doesn't it just make sense? The equity is there. It's going to eventually go back up. Like, doesn't it make sense to buy or, or why, why are you saying not yet? I haven't seen the signals yet that show me that the decline is close to an end. And that's what I'm waiting for. It's like back to that, you know, day early versus week late philosophy. I want to see some evidence uh, that I can uh, agree with that's going to tell me that the trend is about to change. Because it, to me, real estate investing is more about trend than it is about just, you know, buy and hold, right? I, I, I want to get in, you know, when the market's starting to climb, not if it's going to be level for five or six years, it's it's not that exciting, uh, and and I don't have any evidence that it might not perhaps do that. You know, we we might be at the bottom, but it might not go up for a decade. And if that happens, it's a long, slow, painful slog. Uh, believe me. Uh, so I want to see that. You know, we're going to see uh, a shift in trend, and then then I'll be more excited about about getting in. So I, I'm, I'm just not seeing that we're there yet. So somebody's saying, Hey, yeah, look, I, I agree hundred percent with Brian. Like I, we haven't bought in a while. We don't plan on buying. What, like, what are you doing then? Are you just golfing every day? Yeah, pretty much. I'm, yeah. uh, yeah, just play golf, go to the beach. Uh, you know, I mean, me personally, I, uh, uh, just finished building a new house. So, you know, I've been, been a lot of that kind of stuff going on. I've been really busy with that for the last couple of years. It's, so that's been kind of occupying some of my time while I haven't been buying anything. Uh, I, I started up a debt fund and have been running a debt fund and buying real estate debt for the last couple of years, uh, which has been good. I, I started up a lending company about six years ago and you know that absolutely took off. And then we had an exit from it. We had a publicly traded buyer that came along and made an unsolicited offer. So I went through a company sale um, about a year ago. And uh, so, you know, that kind of stuff has has kept me uh, busy enough. I'm just now getting to the point where it's like, okay, I'm I'm going to start running out of things to do soon. And, um, you know, then then who knows? I mean, uh, I'm paying a lot more attention to the stock market lately than I ever have before. Hmm. And um, and and making a few plays what, there what that excites have been paying you, off pretty nice. What excites you about the stock market that makes you feel like that's not a peak? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, we had a rundown in prices over the last couple of years. And um, uh, as you saw yesterday, just the hint that rates might come down sent the stock market into like a frenzy. Yeah. And as rates continue to decline, I think that's going to steamroll and that there's going to be, um, you know, some gains to capture over the course of the next couple of years as rates start to improve. And, um, you know, I, I just think there's, you know, some smartly chosen plays 
uh, will uh, have some good results. And I've, I've found actually some pretty damn good results over the last year, which has been, uh, been kind of nice. So I, I've been, I've been doing that a little bit and, you know, just still underwriting potential real estate acquisition opportunities to see what the market looks like. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really thinking of buying any of the things that I'm underwriting. It's more of like, let's see how far off we are. <laughs> yeah. More of an exercise just to kind of keep your finger on the mar market and understand what's going on. Yeah, you you can't you can't uh, recognize the signal if you're not looking yeah. at the signals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agree. Yeah, I mean we're we're kind of, you know as I talked about to you before the show. I mean we're kind of the same way. We don't call ourselves. Uh, we don't we don't say we're not active buyers. We always say we're active buyers because we are active buyers. If we have if the right price, the right property comes around and it makes a lot of financial sense, we're going to buy it. But we're not even close. <laughs> on most of yeah. these deals that we're looking at and we recognize that we're not close and the brokers are like you know they i think a lot of brokers understand it like they get they're like yeah I, I get i get where you're at like they 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 get it but of course they're going to sell for whatever they can get somebody else is willing to pay more and a lot of the deals that we're seeing they're it's just the seller kind of trying to see where the market's at. And if the, they don't get their price, they're not going to sell. And quite frankly, we've been that seller too over the last um, year or so. Hey, if, if you want to pay our price, we're happy to sell it to you. Well, you know, there's an old saying that says that um, anyone who is trying to sell me something is immediately disqualified as being an expert. <laughs> so when a broker is telling you this is the time to buy... Uh, you know, you have to take that advice for what it is and recognize that uh, a broker's job is to sell uh, the seller's real estate. Uh, they have to tell you this is a good time to buy because they're not going to sell that uh, seller's real estate if they're telling you this is a terrible time to buy. Uh, so I completely get that. I understand the broker's perspective and quietly they understand our perspective that, you know, hey, <laughs> the numbers just don't really work. They get it. Yeah. Uh, but they, you know, their job is to sell real estate. Now, remember when that real estate transacts on the day of closing, there's a wire uh, transfer sent to that uh, broker in payment for their commission. And that wire goes into their bank account. And that's the last they ever have to worry about that deal. Right. Uh, they have no sleepless nights to worry about. They have no problem solving. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't mean to take it too lightly. Certainly brokers do have to solve some post-closing problems. And, you know, they do have to play psychologist once in a while. I get that. Uh, but they uh, they can sleep well at night, whereas the buyer now has to deal with whatever the market and residents and everything else is throwing at them. And if they bought it wrong, the things that the market and everything else will throw at them um, can be enormously stressful. And, uh, you know, life's too short for that. Yeah. And that, that, and that broker, their main job after that sale is to build a relationship with the new buyer and to hope to sell it in, you know, three to five years. So Yeah. And, and, you know, of course, brokers don't want to sell somebody something that they know is going to be this huge, you know, disaster because they're going to be getting calls from that buyer saying, Hey, you sold me this thing and now I'm in trouble, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to imply that, you know, brokers just absolutely don't care, but they don't have the same risk profile that that, right. that buyer has. And, and certainly, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. The next move is to sell that property again. And, and so, uh, you know, the, each of us uh, buyers and owners has to make our decision for when the risk uh, kind of matches uh, where uh, we are comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people would have wished they would have, I would have had you on the show in 2021 when you were saying, Hey, I'm selling and this is why uh, they might have made different decisions. Uh, but we're here, we're here in 2023. What, you know, we talk a little, talked a little bit about some potential distress. We haven't seen a lot. There's been some, um, but we haven't seen a lot of distress and I'm specifically talking multifamily. Um, what do you feel 
is is going to happen with the distress situation. We've got a lot of bridge debt, a lot of debt coming due over the next couple of years. Um, I guess take out your crystal ball and what are you kind of feeling like is going to happen here? There's going to be a wide variety of outcomes, in my opinion. And a lot of that's going to depend upon each owner's specific lender and their lender's particular position. And, you know, the, the success or failure of a lot of these deals, especially in the face of an adverse market like we're seeing now, that success or failure is kind of written into the script at the time you make the acquisition and design the capital structure. So one of the things that's going to take uh, the most uh, people out of this business or create the most distress or the most heartache is going to be improper capital structures generally surrounding uh, short maturities on, on loans. And so in 2021 20, and 2022, 20, 2020, that whole period, transactions were dominated by uh, bridge debt and debt fund uh, debt. And it's funny, we'd make an offer on property. And, you know, of course, we're coming in a couple million dollars low. And we'd ask the broker, you know, well, you know, who's who's using agency financing in this deal? Because we are, we're using low leverage agency financing to propose, you know, as we structure this, this deal, who else is doing that? And like, no one, literally every offer that we're getting is coming from someone using bridge debt. And that was another signal that it was time to get out, but that's yeah. a you know, whole other story. But there, there was a large percentage of transactions during this peak period uh, where bridge debt was extraordinarily common. And bridge debt comes with two characteristics that are imperiling. One is a floating interest rate, uh, which uh, in general isn't a bad thing in and by itself, uh, there's a lot of reasons to use floating interest rate debt. I do it about 100% of the time. Hmm. But um, there's the other characteristic is uh, a short maturity. They generally have a three-year maturity. Sometimes they'll have two one-year extension options. So you can get to five years. And oftentimes those extension options have covenants that must be met in order to qualify for them. They're not necessarily automatic. So what we're finding now is you get, you know, two years into this three year uh, deal and you find out how quickly three years goes by. It's a blink of an eye in the commercial real estate world. Right. And next thing you know, you're facing a loan maturity. And oh, by the way, uh, interest rates have more than doubled. Uh, property values have fallen. Therefore, the cash flow of the property doesn't support your current debt level. The value of the property doesn't meet LTV requirements. Uh, you know, debt yields aren't there to uh, allow you to exercise the extension options. And, you know, both buyer or owner and uh, lender are in a squeeze. And so where do you go from here? Well, some lenders are uh, kicking the can down the road by you know, waiving uh, covenants for qualifying for extension options and granting them anyway, if the borrower has enough cash to continue to support the debt and will continue to make payments in the hopes that lower rates or higher property values one or two years down the road will allow them to either foreclose later <laughs> when the market is better uh, and keep a performing loan on the books, uh, or maybe the owner will be able to sell and pay them off. Uh, so that's one potential outcome. Another potential outcome is your lender might be a loan to own shop. They might've made you that loan because they wouldn't mind owning your, that real estate for whatever percentage of value they loaned you when you bought it. And you know now they can foreclose on you and take it from you and wipe out your investors and, and get a good deal. That's another potential outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, there's lenders out there that, operate on a levered basis. In fact, a high number of them operate on a levered basis, which means the lender themselves are not loaning you their own money. They're borrowing money from someone else to lend to you for your real estate. And their lenders might be putting pressure on them. They might yeah. be saying, hey, you got to get this loan off your warehouse line. Uh, you've got to get some of this uh, you know, risky loan off your books. You need to lighten up your balance sheet. Uh, so there's all kinds of pressure points that be coming in externally that could cause lenders to put varying degrees of pressure on their borrowers. And so, 
it's there's not really a single answer here. What happens to these owners who are in this position is going to vary a lot depending on who their lender is and and what kind of pressures their lender is under and how they design their capital structure. Yeah, I actually uh, was just talking with a loan uh, a mortgage broker the other day, and they said that it's actually easier if you are in a property that has a little bit of distress to it, not necessarily distress, but the, the DSCR isn't, is, is under that one, two for sure. Um, maybe even under one, they said, it's just easier to get to strike a deal with the lender because they don't want a non-performing property back. But if you have a DSCR that hovers around that 120, 125, that's harder to it's harder to get done. They just want you to sell it. They want to get it off their books. They say, sell it, refinance it, whatever. They want it off their books. And so that that's actually a precarious position to be in because you probably can't refinance without putting cash into it. And you might not be able to sell for profit. So now you're just going to have to sell for maybe the debt or slightly over the debt. Well, the lender doesn't care if you make a profit. The lender cares about one thing. They want their money back. And so if the property is non-performing, they realize that if they take the property back, they might not get their money back. And then they're also going to have to manage this asset. But if if the property is performing well and um, your debt cover is good, but yet you can't sell for a price that will exceed the amount of their loan, that's not their concern. Uh, you can sell for the amount of their loan, you better sell and pay them off. That's yep. going to be their approach. And, and I think it's absolutely true uh, what you're hearing. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, so almost better to be in a bad position than that, but hopefully not in either of those positions uh, is where you're at. So what's the, you know, we've talked a little bit about it, but what's the future? Like, what, what are you, what are you hoping uh, happens over the next couple of years for Praxis, for your company? What do you, what do you want to see if, if you could just have your way with the market, the market did exactly what Brian wanted, what would that look like? Uh, I think it would stay uh, really crappy for another year or so to weed out competition, stimulate uh, more distress, create more opportunities, and then turn a corner and start to climb out. Uh, I don't think, I think there's a lot of owners that wouldn't be able to last another year. uh, And it would, it would shake out um, some distress. Now, it's a terrible thing to say. It's a really horrible position to take. But you know, as a as a buyer of distressed assets for 33 years now, uh, it's kind of been like the the best times of my business have always taken place in two places. One at the very bottoms of markets, and two is at the very tops of markets. Uh, you know, when we can right. exit. So uh, right now we're really light. Uh, we could bulk up a lot. Uh, when this thing troughs out and then sell again at the next market cycle peak, you know, and then sail off into the sunset. I'm, I'm not getting any younger. So I've got, I've got at least another one or two rounds, I think left (laughs) in me. Yeah. What I think is going to be interesting is if interest rates do come down considerably uh, and, and it kind of just allows people to, refinance and to continue to hold the market i can see that flat line that you talked about earlier where it just it doesn't go up it doesn't go down it maybe goes up a little bit maybe goes down a little bit but the market's not doing one or the other and just kind of flat lines there 1992 to 1997 yeah just a stagnant market nothing yeah right Right. So that, that'll be interesting to see kind of what happens. I think if interest rates go down, I mean, like the 10 years been going down and if it continues, that's lazy, you know, which is nice for people who have properties that need that. Right. But it, it's the market really needs these shakeups for, I, I, I believe they're, they're good for the market. And if you get trapped in, of course it sucks for you, but I believe that these market shakeups are, are healthy. Well, they are. What's not healthy is for prices to run up like they did in 21 and 22 in perpetuity. I mean, you can make a lot of money when that happens, but it's not really good for anyone. I mean, it's not good for uh, housing. 
uh, and yeah. and tenants and residents, you know, because right. as, as prices of these properties go up, owners have to keep raising rents in order to make profits and sell for higher prices later on down the line. Um, and that's that's not good for anyone that's renting real estate, right? Because they have to be able to afford to live and, uh, you know, having prices kind of moderate a little bit is a good breather to allow incomes to catch up uh, and, you know, keep housing affordable for people. I mean, if, if nobody can attain affordability, then eventually everything kind of collapses and that's not good for anyone. Yeah, I think there's there was a ton of talk all across the country of rent control. A few cities enacted rent control, including where I live in, in St. Paul. Um, but I think the longer that went, you know, that the the last cycle, if that would have just continued for another two, three, four years, and we would have seen rents going up double digits, uh, it, it would have been all over the country. Now, right. I don't think... And maybe I'm wrong, but I don't hear as many municipalities talking about rent control. Rents are going down, they're staying stagnant, and it's not as big of a deal. And the longer that happens, if that can happen for another year or two, that, like you said, it helps affordability. Wages can catch up to rents. Now rents are affordable again. Now rents can increase again, two, three, four percent, and that's healthy. So. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, you know, a lot of this, this run up, especially late in the cycle here in, you know, after 2020, and maybe even if you'd say like after 27, 16 or 17, a lot of the price increases were cap rate compression driven, even mm -hmm. more so than they yeah. were rent growth driven. And so, you know, there's, there's so many people out there that created some uh, really impressive track records uh, in their syndication portfolio, you know, buying when your friends sold in 2016 and selling in 2022 when he was buying again, uh, you know, they made really good um, put runs on the scoreboard, so to speak, but it had nothing to do with their operational prowess or their outsized skill. It had everything to do with cap rate compression that was market driven beyond their control. And, you know, when you get cap rates compressed from six to seven percent down to three to four percent, which is a significant increase in property value, by the way, that's uh, uh, th that's unsustainable because they can't go from three percent to zero percent and they can't go below zero. Uh, so eventually cap rates have to get to a point where they could you know, begin compressing again. And in order to do that, they have to decompress. Right. And, and, you know, they have, there's a long road to decompress from 3% to 6%. And the bad news about that is that's a 50% haircut in pricing. Huge. But, but 6% is a much more reasonable cap rate and 6% yeah. allows some room for cap rate compression to come into play again. Uh, when the conditions are ripe to allow that to happen. And their conditions would never be ripe, in my opinion, to see general broad-based market cap rates compress any further than they already had when we, when we were at the middle of um, 2021 and early 22. Yeah, I mean, that's the lowest we've ever seen. So, And I, I think it's probably the lowest we'll ever see. Yeah, yeah. Hard to, hard to say ever, ever, but you, you might be right. I mean, that, was, that they, they were pretty low um, at that time. So, well, Brian, look, any last thoughts uh, before we wrap up? Well, I, I think, um, you know, the, the market and, uh, and the uh, environment out here is going to be interesting over the next one to two years. Uh, if you don't wait five years to have me back on, we might have some interesting stories to tell, <laughs> uh, you know, in a, in a couple of years. And it'll be it'll be interesting to see how the tone of this conversation changes uh, during that period. So I, I think, um, you know, your listeners should be watching closely uh, to what's going on out there and being prepared. I think this is a really good time for operators to work on their business plans and you know build their investor lists and and learn something from this experience right. i think it's a good time for passive investors to be you know uh, uh, thinking about uh, where they're going to uh, round up their capital for their next round of investments uh, 
and I think that the start, uh, getting back into kind of more of what we we all might call a normal market, which there really is no such thing, but if we were to call it such a thing, is going to be a bit of a slow ramp up because um, people are going to be fearful. It's going to be difficult to raise yep. money. The harder it is to raise money, the more you know you're kind of at the bottom. And so uh, you know, don't get overconfident about how much money you can raise because uh, it's going to be tougher to raise money initially. But, um, you know, once things get going, uh, you know, there could be some really interesting times ahead. And I, I look forward to seeing how that plays out. Yeah, fear plays a big role in what investors are going to put into to your deal. And when the market's Going down, obviously, that plays a big role in their fear. But even when the market's bottomed, I, again, I wasn't in real estate prior to 2008, but I remember buying in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, even, and hearing people that were investors, that were seasoned investors, call me crazy for buying because the market was in shambles and and i'm hearing um from very institutional companies that were sitting on the sidelines waiting for the market to go up before they bought um and and so there's just a lot of fear and investors are going to be leery and i agree i mean if you if you could have raised you know 20 million dollars 10 million dollars whatever a million dollars you're Cut, cut that down quite a bit. Like you're not going to be able to raise the same amount of money and it's going to take you longer. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, there was a massive amount of euphoria in the market in 2005. Everybody was a real estate investor. Everybody wanted to buy a rental house for 500 grand that rented for 1500 a month. It made no sense, but everybody wanted to do that. And in 09, no one wanted real estate. It was catching a falling knife. It was a, a lost asset class. It was no good. It was uh, I when I first started uh, buying rental houses in the San Francisco Bay Area it was 2010, and I was at a family office conference and was talking about you know I had a booth there and we were talking about what we were doing buying these single family homes, and this family office guy you know real experienced investor big money guy comes up to me and he's like you are flat out absolutely wrong he's like this is not the time to be buying to hold real estate this right. is the time to be flipping I'm like no we're actually moving from a flipping model to more of a buy and hold model. And he's like, yeah, this is just the wrong time. And that was how I knew it was the absolute right time. Yep. And so when we were out trying to raise money, we were getting turned down left and right. We were at the top floor of every high rise in San Francisco, talking to all these different big money uh, hedge funds and stuff. And and of course, you know, left and right, they're saying, you know, no, 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 this is the wrong time. And that really drove the point home. It was the right time. And, you know, we bought a lot of property at really discounted pricing. And, you know, we we made a killing on it in five years. And, you know, when the market was getting euphoric again. So, yeah, watch for that psychology because it really does make a big difference. And I think we're we're still seeing people saying, oh, it's still a good, this is a good time to buy. I'm not seeing enough people saying this is a terrible time to buy yet. So uh, I'm not ready to call the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. The same, the same thing was happening with banks during that time too. They were calling you crazy and stupid and like, no, yeah. we, we can't, we can't lend you. And I'm like, you were lending at the peak of the market and lost a ton of proper, or, you know, you had a head of yeah. clothes on a bunch of properties. And now these properties are literally like pennies on the dollar, but you're not willing to lend on them. You're we, there's yeah, something that, wrong there. <laughs> that tells you a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So well, cool, Brian. Again, really appreciate you being on the show. Uh, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, they can go to our website at praxcap.com. Our company's Praxis Capital. The website is praxcap.com. You can find me on biggerpockets.com sometimes. You can uh, follow me on Instagram at investor Brian Burke. You can check out my book, The Hands Off Investor, at biggerpockets.com forward slash syndication book. Yeah, by the way, great book. If you are, whether you're, uh, actively a syndicator raising money. Uh, I think that's a great book and it's a great book to give as a gift. Uh, and I'm trying, I'm not trying to really promote Brian's book, 
but I guess I am like, he's not paying me to do this, but it's a great book. And if you're a passive investor, it's definitely an ex excellent book. Whether you invest with Brian, whether you invest with me, whether you invest with anybody, it's just good common sense stuff that you, you need to know. And so just pick up that book and, and read it. I think it's excellent. Brian, again, appreciate you being on the show. Uh, thanks a lot. And I, it won't be five years. We'll have you back here uh, shortly. So appreciate it. I look forward to it. Thanks for having me on again. And I'll see you in less than five years. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. Your rating and review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.